So we will uh, go through the definitions, brief vascular anatomy, then bedside differentiation, and uh, categorization, mimics, and take on. Okay. So definition, as you know, cerebrovascular accident or stroke is a syndrome characterized by rapid onset of neurological symptoms and signs, such as hemiparesis, sensory abnormalities, or aphasia and or aphasia due to a vascular insult. And that is the ICD code for this. And uh, it should not be a sequelae of uh, trauma or subarachnoid hemorrhage. So due to a vascular cause, but not due to trauma or subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, that is the definition. So why is it important for us? Because it is the major global health problem. And first classification of strokes comes from the National Institute of Disorders for Blindness. And uh, you know the stroke prevalence is about 84 to 262 per 100,000 in the rural and much more in the urban population worldwide. And uh, what are all the subtypes of strokes? All of you know, but still I will go through this. And you know the major component is ischemic, that is about 85%, and 15% is hemorrhagic. Among the ischemic stroke, you have got 30% uh, no, is cryptogenic. All investigations may still not uh, reveal the cause. And 20% uh, is cardioembolic, 20 per 25 is small vessel disease and lacunes, and atherosclerotic disease is 20%, and some 5% rare causes like uh, cardiacel, caracel, vasculitis, mitochondrial disease, those group of disorders. So you can have ischemic stroke, which is thrombosis versus embolic, and hemorrhagic stroke, venous strokes, lacunes, then transient attack, and rare causes like vasculitis, moya, moya, mitochondrial disease, melas, cardacil, caracil, that is cerebral autosomal dominant uh, disease, that is uh, cardacil, and uh, recessive disease is caracil, genetically determined presence of migraine with uh, uh, devastating uh, complications and dementia, then complicated migraine and congenital causes like anomalies in the vessel wall. So normally what is the bra, I will not go through all the pathomechanisms. mechanisms, that is not possible. When you have, uh, you have got uh, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, age, and cholesterol. These are the common comorbidities. All of them lead to endothelial dysfunction. When there is endothelial dysfunction, there is vasoconstriction and lipid deposition. And when there is vasoconstriction, lipid deposition, blood cells are there and infiltrate. They proliferate and growth and migration of smooth muscle fibers mediated through various growth factors will happen. That results in atherosclerosis, cardiac and cerebrovascular disorders. However, stroke and MI patients differ in the risk subsequent to vascular, or risk of subsequent vascular events. As you know, once uh, cardiac is a muscle, brain is fat. So all interventions, uh, complications, risk benefit are different because it is brain is not having you know, muscle, it is fat. And, uh, brain, and the vascular supply of the brain is more complex than the simple vascular anatomy of the heart. Then uh, coronaries get blood during diastole, whereas brain gets blood during systole. So all these problems leads to outcome differences between the heart and the brain. Even though principles of interventions and pathologies probably same. And as you know, the brain weighs about 140 grams. So that is 2% of the total body weight. And normal cerebral blood flow is about 50 ml per 100 grams per minute. And lower values in the white matter. That is uh, about 20 ml per 100 gram. And gray matter has got about 80 ml per 100 grams. And average is 50 ml per 100 gram. The rate of flow in an adult is about 750 ml per minute and about 15 and forms about 15% of the cardiac output. And brain consumes 3.5 ml of oxygen per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute, which remains constant throughout wakefulness and sleep. That means even in sleep, brain is active, only the body is resting. So brain and heart to work during wakefulness and sleep. And we'll briefly see the oscular anatomy. Arch of iota gives rise to three major trunks. Yeah, all of you know that. 
the brachiocephalic trunk or innominate artery on the right side, which divides into the right common carotid and right subclavian. On the left side, you have got the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery independently arising. And on the right side, it is a common innominate trunk. And major muscular systems the, are the carotid system and the vertebrobasilar system. We know that. The, these are going um, from the arch of iota, they go into the brain. The carotid arteries and their branches supply the anterior two third of the cerebral hemisphere, including the deep white matter and the basal ganglia. And each minute, about 600 to 700 ml of blood is received. The vertebrobasilar are the posterior circulation with their branches supply the remaining posterior one third of the brain and uh, which forms the medial side of the hemisphere, cerebellum, brain stem, and cervical spinal cord. And this is having a lower blood flow rate, about 100 ml, it's lower system. That is why interventions can be little more delayed because the posterior circulation uh, needs less blood. So posterior circulation interventions can be uh, delayed for more hours than the anterior circulation. So that is the principle. Posterior circulation is getting about only 100 to 200 ml of blood per minute, that is sufficient, unlike the anterior circulation. And what are all the vessel wall anomalies? We thought about congenital anomalies. So we can have fenestrations, duplications, hypoplastic arteries, persistence of normal embryonic arteries, anastomosis between the uh, various uh, vascular systems. And this causes, what does it cause? This causes arterial geometry associated atherosclerosis. So some of our patients are not much risk factors, but still they come with the devastating strokes. They are classified usually under cryptogeny. The cause for that may be arterial geometry associated atherosclerosis, arterial variants and aneurysms, neurovascular conflict syndromes. All this leads to uh, vascular uh, integrity related cause for strokes. So we know the two common carotid arteries move up lateral to the trachea at the upper part of the larynx, leave it in the external. Common carotid branch external carotid has several branches and said this the this is the vertebral artery and the, the spinal arteries, basilar artery with the ICA. Uh, uh, superior cerebral artery, Ica and the Pica, and you have got the posterior cerebral arteries. This is the circle of villis, anterior cerebral artery, anterior communicating artery, middle cerebral artery, uh, posterior communicating artery, and the circle of villis. So, brachiocephalic artery is the largest branch of the aortic heart, divides as right common carotid and right subclavian, and common carotid artery on both sides ascend up to the thyroid cartilage, then divide into internal carotid and external carotid. External carotid artery has carotid sinus with the receptor. So that is how we identify the arterial anatomy in the angiogram. Internal carotid artery is actually lateral to the external carotid artery. But internal carotid artery, because of the carotid sinus, shows a bulge at the beginning. And uh, this contains the receptors of the glossopharyngeal nerve, which produce reflex hemodynamic modifications and maintains intracranial pressure. And carotid body has got a humor supply. Any issue? Huh? Any problem? Am I audible? Yes. Because some issues are there. I don't know whether somebody is not hearing. Or not. Mm, okay. So we know the various parts of the internal carotid artery, cervical, petrous, cavernous, cerebral. And these are all only of uh, theoretical interest when we uh, plan interventions, where you intervene, where you don't intervene, are known to all of you. So it goes uh, up through the various uh, uh, sections are there for the internal carotid artery, cervical part, petrous part, cavernous part, and the cerebral part. And that divides into the anterior and the middle cerebral artery. And the intracranial part starts after the petrous segment and, and enters the cavernous sinus. <laughs> Here is the meningohypophyseal trunk, which supplies the meninges and the hypophysis. 
Then in the supraclinoid part, the first vessel is the ophthalmic artery. Then we have got the posterior communicating artery. Then the anterior coronal artery. The supraclinoid part is the ophthalmic artery, posterior communicating artery, anterior coronal artery. So these are the various branches. This is Nutter's diagram. So you can see, go through all the minor branches. We get the stroke diagnosis. Vascular anatomy is useful to localize the same thing which I said. All the branches are there. This is from the Nutter's. There is a little more different view. So let us see the ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery has got an orbital. This is important to diagnose common carotid artery disease. So because it is vulnerable for intervention, you can do stenting and other things in the extracranial large vessel disease. So when the ophthalmic artery is getting affected on one side, you know the disease is in the large vessel. So it is uh, having an orbital part, ocular part, and an extra orbital branches. And the main branch is the central retinal artery. It enters the optic nerve one centimeter uh, between the nerve, divides into superior division, inferior division, and each one of them divide into nasal branches and temporal branches. And then we have got the ciliary artery. Ciliary artery, long and short posterior ciliary arteries, they supply the choroid and the ciliary process. And it is ciliary artery to the sclero, -sclero corneal junction and the iris. <laughs> So that is the first branch, ophthalmic artery. Central retinal artery occlusion, posterior ciliary artery occlusion, these are all commonly seen. Central retinal artery occlusion is important to diagnose common character artery, uh, artery to artery embolism, uh, whereas uh, posterior ciliary artery get, generally gets involved in giant cell arteritis. Then posterior communicating artery, it supplies the optic tract, optic chiasm, anterior and posterior hypothalamus and ventral thalamic nuclei. And fetal type of posterior communicating artery is large than the posterior cerebral artery and supplies the territory of the posterior cerebral artery also. Then it is called fetal posterior communicating artery. Then what is anterior coronal artery? It supplies the posterior two-third of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And the structures involved are optic tract, Optic radiation, lateral geniculate body, amygdala, uncus, posterior paraventricular corona radiata, and thalamus. So, this is um, from the base, you can see the various arteries the anticellular artery, anterior communicating artery, the internal carotid artery, and uh, internal carotid artery coming, and the middle cerebral artery. Then you have the posterior communicating artery. Then we have the posterior cerebral artery, the basal artery, vertebral artery, and the anterospinal artery. So why we should uh, have classifications uh, to characterize ischemic stroke? Because it is relevant for making a correct diagnosis, and it enables prompt treatment options, which are uh, a little more available now, and predict future risk in subgroups of certain discrete features, and also classification is important for cl clinical trials and research purpose, as well as genetic analysis for predicting genetic risk. So unless you categorize, you cannot put all the, the particular events in your... Yeah. ...type of classification, how it is, that is the bedside classification. That is done using record of so yeah. make the no, no, note down the record all the abnormal test findings and stratify them. Assign degree of probability for every possible etiology. So you have diabetes, hypertension, smoke. So in what way this particular risk factor is involved? That phenotypic classification involves all these parameters, degree of probability as a causal role in the uh, etiology, then targeted towards describing the concurring underlying pathology without highlighting the most probable etiology. And ideal for large scale epidemiological genetic studies, where you don't depend so much on the laboratory, just to decode the clinical findings and correlate with comorbidity, consider the probability, 
that is for epidemiological studies then assign patients with ischemic stroke in a single category based available clinical epidemiological and diagnostic data so that is one classification that is phenotypic classification and focus on establishing the most likely cause and do not neglect the other associated diseases so that is uh, that parameters are used in the toast ccs and css criteria so what is this toast criteria why we are i will uh, there are nearly 250 criteria i will not go into any one of them the most commonly used criteria is the uh, toast criteria um uh, because that is commonly used so it was implemented in the year 1993 this takes into account the clinical features neuroimaging echocardiography neurosonology and angiography and uh, so what are all the parameters clinical features is it large artery disease is it cardioembolic disease is it small vessel disease other determined etiology and is there no etiology there may be two or more causes uh, but we may not be able to correlate them uh, or it may be a negative evaluation you have not completed the evaluation or incomplete evaluation so those are clinical parameters used in the toast criteria then uh, clinical findings neuroimaging data and diagnostic studies consistent with large artery atherosclerosis and other etiology etiology have been excluded so it is a probable large artery atherosclerosis if you have excluded other causes and you have evidence diagnosed mri evidence of a large artery disease and it is significant if it is more than 50% stenosis or occlusion of a major brain artery immobility due to atherosclerosis and in a patient might experience intermittent claudication ea in the same was carotid growth they may have decreased pulses which help to support the diagnosis and there can be cortical and cerebellar lesions and brain stem and subcortical lesions in fox more than 1.5 cm diameter on ct or mri they are considered as potential large artery atherosclerosis so have radiological evidence of significant stenosis patient has ta and in fox larger than 1.5 cm anywhere in the brain all this support a large artery atherosclerosis and cardio embolic how are you going to uh, categorize cardio embolic by toast criteria at least one, one cardiac source for an emboli must be identified and clinical and imaging findings are similar to those of large artery disease and evidence of a previous ta or stroke in more than one vascular territory yes cardio embolic and from arch of aorta they go to different different vessel so more one vascular territory or systemic embolism supports a clinical diagnosis of cardio embolic stroke and potential large artery atherosclerosis a source of thrombosis or embolism should be eliminated because you can have artery to artery embolism that is what i said if you have common carotid artery one emboli in the central retinal artery another one in the anterior cerebral artery and another one in the middle cerebral artery there even though it is multiple vessels it is attributed to one large artery that is not cardiac embolism so that should be excluded <coughs> and the stroke in a patient with a medium risk cardiac source of emboli but no other cause identified so even though the cardiac embolic risk is very midi- minimum you are not able to identify any other cause still you can categorize it as a cardiac embolic stroke then uh, high risk sources of cardiac embolism you know that it is prosthetic wall uh, valvular heart disease with uh, arrhythmias various kind of arrhythmias atrial appendage thrombus six sinus syndrome recent mi and left ventricular thrombus dilated cardiomyopathy and a kinetic left ventricular segment with low ejection fraction atrial myxomas and infective endocarditis medium risk mvp annular calcification arrhythmia aneurysm patent foramen ovale and minor degrees of cardiac arrhythmia non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis like you get in verrucous 
hepatitis happening in SLE, congestive cardiac failure, hypokinetic left ventricular segment, and myocardial infarction. <laughs> myocardial infarction. Then classifying small vessel disease. So we have gone through large vessel disease criteria, cardiac vessel uh, criteria, and small vessel disease criteria. So clinic, a small vessel disease is probable. Clinical findings, neuroimaging data, and diagnostic studies consistent with small vessel disease. So you have got a clinical lacunar syndrome with no evidence of cortical dysfunction and diabetes and hypertension association. Normal CT MR examination or relevant brain stem or subcortical <laughs> which is less than 1.5. Large vessel disease is more than 1.5. Uh, small vessel disease is less than 1.5. And absent cardioembolic soap. <laughs> then other uh, uh, determined details include patients with rare diseases like non-atherosclerotic vasculopathies, procoagulant state, hematological disorders like hemoglobinopathy, sickle cell disease, and uh, uh, patient has. Uh, so this group in this group. They have clinical and CT or MRI findings of an acute stroke, but size criteria is not used. 1.5 more is large, 1.5 less is small, but undetermined usiology, size criteria is not introduced. And diagnostic studies such as blood test, arterial should reveal one of the unusual causes of stroke. And cardiac embolism, large artery atherosclerosis should be excluded to call it a first criteria of undetermined etiology. <laughs> then you, you should find one or two uh, causes like what we have said as a hemoglobin anomaly, rheological property, abnormalities. And even those who are incompletely evaluated or negative evaluation with whatever you have done, you can still call it as undetermined etiology at that point of time. The advantage of TOS class, uh, classification is it is widely used, easy to apply. All of these, uh, most of these tests, all of us are able to do in any center. And reliability and validity is influenced by clinical expertise. So how we are categorizing, measuring the size, the volume of the impact, all that is important. And the evidence grades frequently neglected. All the uh, severity, the evidence, other comorbidities we may not uh, include. And overestimate the undetermined group uh, because of incomplete evaluation, because incomplete evaluation is categorized under undetermined grip. It is really not undetermined, but you are not completely evaluating. And low, low reliability for minor strokes. So all these points are the disadvantages of this criteria. Now we have a modified TOST criteria that is called a stop stroke study. So there's a little more modification done to complete the investigation. That I am not elaborating. Uh, so that is a modified toast that is called yes, yes, yes. So that is top stroke study. And another modified toast classification is causative classification system for stroke. All these parameters are little more uh, covering the disadvantage of the toast criteria. So that I am not going into. So you have got um, uh, a patient with stroke. You don't have no evident mechanism is seen, criteria for possible mechanisms none, and you do call uh, it as undetermined or unclassified. That is it's only a summary of what I have said. And something is evident, that's is evident etiology. More than one evident mechanism is there. So you find out which is the most probable one. Patient may have smoking, alcohol, hypertension, diabetes. So what is contributing to your patient? That you will need to determine. So that's a flow chart. So then when are you going to diagnose thrombosis at the bedside? Older age group, people who are older, and headache proceeds by several hours uh, in thrombus. Patient may say that he is having a new onset headache, which is pulsatile, dull aching on one side, and uh, he may go to sleep and he might wake up with a stroke. Why is this headache happening? <clears throat> because thrombus has already started, and nature is trying to repair by opening up the transdural vessels. So that produces dilatation of the transdural vessels. That is the cause of the headache. So this headache will not have 
features of icp or anything or never be for headache is not there it's a fulcral headache which is there for some hours so patient will think okay i will take one paracetamol go to sleep and he will with a stroke and the headache is dull pulsatile unilateral due to attempted repair that is dilatation of the transdural vessels and usually this happen thrombus happens in a senior person who is sedentary sleeping and presents as wake up strokes and there is low progression and progression can continue up to 72 hours and seizures at onset are rare or <coughs> usually does not happen and seizure might come very late due to the gliosis several months later and morbidity is more because there is infarction morbidity is more but it is low so mass effect and all is not much so mortality is less so thrombosis older age group headache is by hour and uh, it is a pulsatile headache happens in a sleeping state or sedentary state and presents mostly as wake up stroke and it can progress up to 72 hours and seizures are rare morbidity is more mortality is less that is thrombosis these are the bedside points these are for the younger students please remember these points when embolic stroke young person happens when he is active and she says may be single and it can, it happens at the onset but it is not very common a single seizure at the onset can happen so young person he is not sleeping he is active and a single seizure at the onset can happen and maximum deficit happens at onset unlike thrombus it doesn't keep on progressing and it starts improving very fast and history of tas are common and source may be identifiable hemorrhage again young person and usually active person and if it occurs in sleep it wakes the patient from sleep it doesn't present as a wake up sleep stroke if it happens patient will wake up from the sleep and you know, headache is an hour before headache is the new onset hour before headache sometimes we call it as thunder clap like headache and vomiting is common repeated seizures happen and progression can be few hours it can be step wise if the person is having a bleeding disorder or he is on some blood thinners and mortality is more because of mass effect <coughs> once it recovers because it is not destroying the brain parenchyma it is only compressing so once they recover the disability is much less than the thrombus mortality is more but morbidity is less then thromboembolism what is that you have got a thrombus in a major vessel which is embolizing that's what i told common carotid artery so low flow taa so this is a taa which is happening in the different branches of the same vessel then look at the source vessel so you have got an ri cerebral artery taa then mca taa and then you have retinal artery taa you don't look at the heart you look at the common carotid artery so they are called low flow taa they are not they are artery to artery embolism even though they are embolism they are not cardio embolic they are artery to artery embolism what are venous strokes very common in karnataka uh, some parts of india uh, this happens in young people they may be in the post operative post traumatic post alcohol heavy alcoholic binge post partum associated malignancy procoagulant stress drugs L asparagin etc it presents with severe headache seizures raised intracranial pressure and the seizures may be multifocal and multifocal neurological deficit because multiple branches get thrombosed and they recanalize due to plasmin plasminogen system and thrombus progresses so multifocal seizures multifocal neurological deficit severe icp headache and recurrent seizures is a typical feature of feature of venous strokes then what about dissection young person uh, context usually you have a dynamic injury jump down from a moving vehicle or you get involved in some break dance boxing somebody doing uh, neck manipulation some people do neck manipulation so this produces dissection and pain in the site of the vessel vertebral artery or carotid artery and the location deep in the neck means vertebral superficial in the carotid and they can have taa in that territory and progression in neurology can happen up to 72 hours so young person 
take the contest into account pain at the site not in the head and ta in the same territory and can progress up to 72 hours so you can see this classical flame shaped uh, occlusion that is due to intima getting bulge and produces the this is typical of dissection vestibular artery dissection so um, what are the questions so i have told you the causes toast criteria which is for research purpose teaching purpose also you can apply in the bedside and simple undergraduate of, uh, differentiation of thrombosis embolism hemorrhage thromboembolism and venous strokes then once you have decoded all the features the question remains is it a cva or a cva mimic if it is a cva is it ischemic or hemorrhagic if ischemic thrombotic or embolism and if it is a uh, definite embolic or thrombotic stroke which is the territory and if it is hemorrhagic what is the cause and is there a possibility of a venous stroke these are the questions you have to answer what are all the situations where you think of a stroke mimic progression more than 72 hours continuing to deteriorate it may be stroke mimic it may be a bleeding into your tumor which has brought the symptom into light the tumor might have been silent and the bleeding into the tumor or an infarct into your tumor so progression more than 72 hours drowsiness more than weakness suppose you have subdural hematoma mass effect on the brain surface is more more but parenchymal involvement is less so they are more drowsy than weak and disproportionate incontinent you might find grade 4 power but the person is incontinent and icp type of headache presence of raised intracranial type of headache you have to think of a stroke mimic and fluctuations one time is very alert and one time is very drowsy depending on a subdural location when your head position changes and the subdural hematoma goes into the base of the brain the sensorium sensorium might improve when it is on the surface of the brain patient will be drowsy so fluctuations and too rapid improvement with anti edema mist when you give some manitol suddenly patient sits up then you know the cause culprit is producing more icp than more parenchymal damage so these situations if they are there you think of a stroke mimic so progression more than 72 hours drowsiness more incontinence more icp headache fluctuation and too rapid improvement with anti edema measures you give one manitol you think that the patient is cured and feel very happy that's a warning thing it is not a stroke then our localization depends on the common colors you know that the superior lateral surface contains the uh, hand and the head and the trunk is towards the uh, inner hemispheric region and in the inner hemispheric region you have got the legs so that determines the territory so now we have seen what are all the stroke mimic situations now we want to know the territory so when are you going to think it's a common carotid artery disease so it is a class Classical stuttering hemiplegia. Because as you have seen, common carotid artery has many many branches. So it can produce thrombus in the common carotid artery, and small small emboli can go into multiple vessels and present as a stuttering hemiplegia. We otherwise call it as a step-like progression. So one emboli has happened, stable, another emboli, stable, another emboli, and you have you can you can you have ipsilateral ophthalmic artery, and Contral lateral ACA, MCA, uh, TAS. So, ipsilateral ophthalmic, contral lateral ACA, MCA, stuttering type of weakness, and large hemispheric infarcts, and carotid sinus related features may or may not be there. Patient may have uh, flat, uh, cardiac uh, features, newly coming tachycardia, uh, fluctuating blood pressure, and a brewery. So, common carotid artery is suspected. When the person has got a step-like progression of the stroke, stuttering hemiplegia, or ipsilateral ophthalmic, ophthalmic and contralateral MCA, ACA, or holo, complete occlusion of the common carotid artery, large hemispheric infarcts, and carotid sinus-related symptoms like autonomic fluctuations, and audible or palpable brewery. <clears throat> so this is a large... Common carotid artery stroke, ACA2, all the branches are uploaded. 
with the mass effect. You can see for subfaltial herniation, hollow hemispheric infarct. So these are, you can see the various territories. You know that here the middle cerebral artery is lying and here the anterior cerebral artery is lying. So anterior cerebral artery strokes will be leg dominant. Middle cerebral artery, we saw the common colors, head and upper limb. And posterior cerebral artery is occipital low, brainstem, cerebellum. So these are the territories supplied by the branches. So that will determine the uh, clinical localization. So MCA, middle cerebral artery, we saw that it is lying in the sylvian fissure. And it uh, gives like to a superior division and an inferior division. Superior division divides into orbitofrontal branches pre-central, central, and anterior parietal branches. And the inferior division divides into posterior parietal, temporal, and angular branches. So, <coughs> so this is the middle cerebral artery, superior division, inferior division with the branches. So here, you know, it is the head to neck, as well as the upper limbs, and part of the trunk. <coughs> so this is a classical MC occlusion. You can see what the CT has picked up is uh, very less. And if you see the MRI, uh, you can see that you have the MCA is uh, not at all seen, it is occluded. So this is uh, MCA occlusion. Anterior part is paired, posterior part is paired, MCA territory, including the subcortical structures are involved. So what it will present, we saw the common colors. So patient will present with upper limbs weaker than the lower limbs. So middle cerebral artery stroke, upper limb will be weaker than the lower limb. And if it is on the dominant side, we saw it is the perisylvian area. Perisylvian area is the language area. So if it is on the dominant side, patient will have aphasia. We saw that it is supplying the both motor and the sensory cortex. So you will have hemianesthesia in addition to hemiplegia. And because of the deep uh, vascular uh, structures are involved, patient will have hemianopia. The optic tract which goes through this uh, subcortex gets involved, so hemianopia. So upper limb weaker than the lower limb, aphasia on the dominant side, associated hemianesthesia and hemianopia is middle cerebral artery stroke. <coughs> We see the anterior cerebral artery. These are the pericolossal and colossal marginal and the terminal branches. Anterior cerebral artery with the pericolossal, colossal marginal and other branches. Here the leg area is there and mild spillover to the superior lateral surface. So when you have an ISC occlusion, lower limb will be weaker than the upper limb. This is the bedside approach for the younger colleagues. So lower limb weaker than the upper limb. Aphasia and hemianopia are uncommon and disinhibition and speech perseveration. Why disinhibition? Because of the frontal involvement, frontal lobe involvement, so they can have frontal lobe features. They can have primitive reflexes, again due to frontal lobe involvement. They can have altered mental status, impaired judgment, gait apraxia, and urinary incontinence, frontal type of incontinence. All this due to the frontal lobe involvement. So lower limb more than upper limb, no aphasia, no hemianopia, and other frontal lobe features, including the primitive reflexes in the bladder, that favors an ACA stroke. So you can see, and so now we'll see the uh, basal ganglia blood supply. Basal ganglia gets supplied through the straight branches. So you have got the lateral straight branches from the middle cerebral artery, Medial straight branches from the anterior cerebral artery and anterior choroidal branches of the internal carotid artery, which supplies the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So you've got the uh, branches which come from the middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, and anterior choroidal artery. So we call it as a one half is supplied by the branches of the middle cerebral artery, outer. And the inner part, anterior cerebral artery, posterior communicating artery and anterior cord artery. So the whole of this part of the internal capsule and the basal ganglia is middle cerebral. The part behind is anterior cerebral, posterior communicating anterior cord artery. So this is a uh, classical anterior cerebral artery infarct in the cingulate region, medial frontal or the 
cingulate region is a deep watershed infarct in the distribution of the anti-cerebral artery. Hmm. So next we will see what are watershed infarcts. We have seen common carotid artery, we have seen middle cerebral artery, we have seen anterior cerebral artery. What are watershed areas? Watershed areas are we see the middle cerebral artery in the sylvian fissure, anterior cerebral artery in the corpus callosum, and posterior cerebral artery posteriorly. The areas which are shared, so border zones. This is middle cerebral, this is anterior cerebral. The border zone between the middle cerebral and anterior cerebral. Border zone between middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and posterior cerebral. So these areas are called watershed areas. So these areas do not have a blood vessel of their own. They get blood supply by perfusion. So this area, this area, they are all watershed area. You can, they are superficial watershed areas and you have got to, so this is a ACA, MCA watershed area. This is between the anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. And this is MCA, PCA watershed area. So ACA, MCA watershed area is here. MCA, PCA watershed area is here and deep watershed areas are here, bilateral symmetrical. So this is MCA, PCA watershed info. These are deep watershed info. That means here the main vessel has not been affected by a common cause. The disease is far away. It may be an MI or it may be a cholera, severe dehydration or a major vessel disease with the branches becoming oligemic. So subcortical areas involved in language, they are called Mary's quadrilateral space. So this is the anterior limb of the inter genu, this is the posterior, this is genu, this is plenium, anterior limb of the sylvian fissure, posterior limb, and you can draw a uh, line like this. This is called Mary's quadrilateral space. So these are subcortical language area. When there is a deep watershed infarct, these areas can get affected and can present with a deep, brief period of uh, mutism. So the structures covered in that are caudate, thalamus, internal capsule, globus pallidus, putamen, and external cap capsule. These on the dominant side present as subcortical aphasia. We start with mutism, dysarthria, and rapid recovery, severe naming defect. Because these are the areas involved in formation of the motor schema for language. So they prepare the motor schema, tell to recruit what muscle for what action. Because it goes, patient becomes mute. And when they start recovering severe dysarthria, naming defect, and then they recover little more faster. <clears throat> so these are some of these uh, examples of watershed infox yeah, between the MC and the PCA. This also same. And this is internal capsule. I have told you that it is supplying by the middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, anterior communicating, posterior communicating artery, and the anterior coronal artery. So this is anterior limb. And the inner part is getting branches from the anterior cerebral artery. And genu is getting branches from the anterior cerebral artery. And also some uh, middle cerebral artery, the outer part. Outer part is middle cerebral artery. Then posterior limb is getting mainly supplied from the uh, anterior caudal artery. And also some, some this charcoal's artery of cerebral hemorrhage is supplying there. And you have got a sublendiform part, which are supplying that uh, supplied by the posterior cerebral and anterior caudal. And retrolendiform part uh, is supplied by the straight branches of the posterior cerebral artery. We know this part is middle cerebral. This part is anterior cerebral, posterior communicating anterior caudal. This share from the middle cerebral artery, straight branches of the middle cerebral artery. So now when a hemiplegia happens in the internal capsule, as you saw, all the structures are packed in a very small area. So differential involvement is less common. Upper limb more involved, lower limb more involved, not applicable here because the homunculus is widespread in the cortex. In the subcortex, everything is together. So patient presents as a dense hemiplegia. Because the sensory fibers are there posteriorly, they get hemianesthesia. Visual fibers are there posteriorly, hemianopia. Because it is subcortical, generally aphasia does not happen. But as I told you, on the dominant side, this internal capsule is in the Mary's quadrilateral space. 
So on the dominant side, they can have transient mutism and uh, followed by dysarthria, naming defect and recover. That can happen. Then upper and lower limbs, there is equal weakness because all the fibers are compact and together. So dense hemiplegia, hemianesthesia, hemianopia, upper and lower limb equal involvement and due, generally no aphasia. But uh, due to involvement of the Mary's quadrilateral space, you can have transient mutism with uh, severe dysarthria naming defect. Then let us see the artery of cerebral hemorrhage. We saw the pseudox artery of cerebral hemorrhage, which supplies the capsulogangleonic region. And this is the common site for hypertensive bleed. That is why we say that when a bleed is happening in the parietal lobe or frontal lobe or cerebellum, the cause may not be hypertensive. Capsulogangleonic is uh, the classical artery of pseudox artery of cerebral hemorrhage involving and it presents due to hypertension. Rest of the areas, if it is happening, look for aneurysms, AVMs, bleeding disorders, or you may have amyloid angiopathy. So capsuloganglionic bleed due to involvement of the pseudox artery of cerebral hemorrhage is hypertension related. Other area hemorrhages look for other causes. Then we have got facio-brachial weakness. It is a common question in the MD examination. We know facio-brachial weakness can happen due to Kubner's artery, which is a branch of the anterior artery, or sometimes you get it due to, we saw the superior division, upper division of the middle cerebral artery also supplies the upper limb and the face. So it, is it due to, is the facio-brachial weakness due to middle cerebral branch occlusion or Kubner's artery? So MCA branch occlusion, you get aphasia on the dominant side, and like the uh, weakness uh, where there is a movement paralysis, precision movements are weaker than the power movement. So distal is weaker than the proximal and sensory can be there. So if it is due to MCA branch occlusion, if you can have aphasia on the dominant side, distal weaker than proximal and sensory can be affected. If it is Huben, Hubner's artery, which is a branch of the anti-reserval artery <laughs> and it does not supply the distal upper limb at all. So patient will have a facio-brachial weakness with minimum facial and upper limb proximal. So it can be mistaken as plexopathy. When you elicit the reflex, you find reflexes are exaggerated. Then you wonder what happened and look for a subtle facial. So subtle facial, proximal upper limb, you can have dysarthria, choreoathetosis, behavioral changes, and sensory does not happen and there is no aphasia. That is Kubner's artery. So Kubner's artery is a facio-brachial weakness where the limb weakness is proximal and they can have additional dysarthria, choreoathetosis and behavioral changes. That is how you differentiate both of them. So this is a uh, deep uh, capsule, uh, carotid artery. Uh, you can, uh, you can caudate infarct. It's a deep uh, watershed infarct involving the caudate. <coughs> Then we will see the anterior caudal artery. So what is the anterior caudal artery supply? It is supplying the posterior limb of the internal capsule. All of us know mainly the sensory fibers and the visual fibers and very little of motor fibers. So this will produce a sensory dominant stroke. So patient will have hemisensory loss. It will resemble a thalamic stroke. And they can have hemianopia because the visual fibers are there and mild hemiparesis. So can sensory dominant stroke hemianopia, mild hemiparesis, which may manifest only as an exaggerated reflex and upgoing planda and not much weakness at all. And there is supply to the temporal lobe and globus pallidus, and that can produce some memory disorientation, confusion, and extrapyramidal features. Mainly it is a sensory stroke with hemianopia, very mild hemiparesis, with or without temporal lobe and globus pallidus related symptoms. So uh, this is again another recapitulation of the uh, vascular supply, which we have already gone through all the branches. Then posterior cerebral artery, it comes from the top of the basilar artery. All of us know it comes from the top of the basilar artery and mainly supplies the occipital loop. So it produces contralateral hemianopia. That is the classical presentation. 
because of its additional supply to the temporal lobes it can produce confusion mild limb weakness dizziness nausea memory loss due to temporal lobe involvement and they can have a posterior cranial headache the posterior cerebral artery so posterior cranial headache classical posterior cerebral artery is chondrolytic hemianopia they can have memory impairment dizziness and disorientation due to uh, its partial supply to the temporal lobe temporal lobe headache is occipital so this is a classical pca info common feature is hemianopia with or without mild temporal lobe symptoms and confusion delirium disorientation and occipital headache other uh, other uh, other occlusions we saw temporal headache or thunder clap headache and pc in fact produces a occipital headache and this is one patient who had a fetal pca and it is a single fetal pca so single fetal pca supplying uh, both sides of the brain so he is having a bilateral occipital cortex cerebellum medial temporal it was a very devastating stroke in a very uh, a person who is not a diabetic not a smoker but uh, one day suddenly he got a stroke which made him completely blind he has a fetal pca and uh, that fetal pca is a single pca supplying both sides so both occipital cortex both temporal lobe cerebellum all got knocked out in one stroke next is basilar artery uh, it is a it is as fatal as rabies so like basilar artery is like rabies if it is a complete basilar artery occlusion patients die they present with vertigo vomiting quadriplegia dysphagia diplopia dysesthesia dysrhythmia cardiac arrhythmia due to autonomic structures in the brain stem getting involved and disordered breathing disordered breathing so you have got various types of breathing depending on the area that is getting involved in the brain stem chain stroke breathing you can you have this is an apneustic breathing cluster breathing depending on part of the brain stem involved hemisphere means chain stroke so depending on the respiration gets altered based on the type of uh, 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 area involved and you get in the brain stem stroke you get decerebrate if the lesion is above the red, uh, if the lesion is above the vestibular nucleus this is decerebrate and if it is decorticate above the red nucleus if the pathology in the brain stem is above the red nucleus you get decorticate posture and you get decerebrate posture if the pathology in the brain stem is above the vestibular nu nucleus so depending on that those respiratory features cranial nerve features Uh, cardiac arrhythmias and the type of posture grossly you can locate in the brain stem and what is this kaplan syndrome so kaplan syndrome is top of the basilar artery stroke so branches coming from the top of the basilar artery getting involved so it's very difficult to diagnose you may think it is miller fisher syndrome long track aortic bite uh, syndrome <laughs> all those mistakes will happen suddenly patient can deteriorate and die they have visual features due to posterior cerebral artery oculomotor fractures due to oculomotor cranial nerve nuclei getting knocked out behavioral abnormality due to temporal lobe involvement and sleepiness hemianopia hallucinations due to cerebral pedangle and abnormal movements can happen but long track signs are not there so you will be wondering what is happening patient has come with ophthalmo paralysis plegia he is hallucinating is it that hudig uh, jalgar syndrome or evolving miller fisher by the time patient goes into a maxi maxillary artery stroke and dies that is called top of the basilar syndrome or kaplan syndrome and uh, we have got the cerebellum we have got superior cerebral artery you have got aica you have got pica grossly to remember cerebellar involvement with midbrain that is superior cerebral artery cerebellar involvement with pons that is middle uh, that is a uh, anterior inferior cerebellar artery superior cerebellar artery cerebellum and midbrain cerebellum and pons is anterior inferior cerebellar artery cerebellum and medulla is pica posterior inferior cerebellar artery so this are the, uh, what is this this is the another vascular artery we call artery of percheron 
this supplies both thalamus. So if the person comes with a artery of Percheron infarct, this is like Kaplan syndrome, this can be mistaken as deep cerebral venous thrombosis, deep CVT, or uh, is it a Japanese encephalitis? All those confusions will come when there is a bilateral thalamic infarct like this in artery of Percheron involvement. These are the uh, other thalamic infarcts. different branches. So that is artery of Percheron. This is a classical thalamic chi, vertical skew deviation, one eye is high, up, another eye is down, and down and in. They are called thalamic chi's. This is again a large Percheron artery infarction, both thalamus knocked out, easily mistaken as JE or deep CVT. Then in the brain stem, you have got various crossed hemiplegias, Depending on the ESR hemi brainstem syndromes, we know the various uh, cranial nerve nucleus uh, present in the midbrain. So when this midbrain gets involved, the cranial nerves in the midbrain are three, four, uh, three and four. So third, now fourth, now red nucleus with cross hemiplegia will be midbrain infarct. And uh, this is another midbrain infarct. And this is a classical patient with a uh, uh, right ophthalmoplegia and left hemiplegia, Weber syndrome. And uh, so you can have uh, third nerve pulse, crossed hemiplegia. Then you can have a secular uh, third nerve involvement. That's a crossed hemiplegia. And you call it as a clot syndrome when there is associated red nucleus involvement and cerebral R signs. So red nucleus, horizontal action tremor, my upper limb incoordination, Associated with oculomotor palsy, that is clot syndrome. Just a third nerve and contral hemorrhage of Weber's associated cerebellar signs <coughs> and red nucleus signs is clot syndrome. And you have Benedict syndrome when it is red nucleus plus hemiplegia. Then you have got Nathanagel syndrome, dorsal midbrain, combination of nuclear and supranuclear gaze limitation and ataxia. These are the various uh, brainstem syndromes. And comes to the ponds, you know that the cranial nerves in the ponds are uh, five, six, seven, eight. So cranial nerves on one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side. This is MLF, one uh, MLF. So MLF can be involved in midbrain and ponds. So MLF or uh, you have five, six, seven, eight cranial nerves with cross hemiplegia. And you call it as millet gubler, ipsilateral sixth, contralateral hemiplegia, ipsilateral seventh. Raymond sixth nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia. And um, medulla, you have got the medial medullary and lateral medullary. Lateral medullary is one important point. You have got uh, uh, ipsilateral facial, contralateral limb sensory, ipsilateral cerebellar, lower cranial palsy, corners, but uh, ataxia, but you never get the pyramidal sign and never get hemorrhage. So pica is the only territory where hemorrhage is never a differential diagnosis. Medial medullary syndromes, you have got the proprioceptive fibers, and you have got the corticospinal fibers and the 12th nerve. So 12th nerve with the proprioception and pyramidal is medial medullary syndrome, very, very uncommon. So pica syndrome, we have discussed also some cases in the past. So classical pica does not produce pyramidal involvement and never hemorrhage. It's a very small infarct, but it produces a lot of uh, disability. Small infarct, lateral medullary infarct. Then this is small vessel disease. So they are white matter infarcts. This is graded by fascica grade, one, two, three, small vessel disease. So bigger picture showing various grades of small vessel disease. And this is moya moya. Moya moya, bilateral intracranial internal carotid occlusion with smoke-like proliferation of small vessel. Bilateral intracranial internal carotid occlusion, smoke-like proliferation of small vessels. That is moya moya, commonly seen in children. In adults, it is uh, uh, symptomatic moya moya due to vasculitis and all. Cadasil, you have got a temporal lobe involvement. So it will not respect a vascular territory. Patient presents with migraine-like headache, later uh, non-territorial infox and dementia, that is cadasil. Temporal white matter involvement is the clue. And spinal arteries, you know, the anterior spinal artery, posterior spinal artery, uh, artery of 
Adam Kiwis and Arteria Cervicalis Magna. Andrea Spinal Artery supplies the anterior two third of the cord. Posterior Spinal Artery supplies only the posterior columns. Adam Kiwis and Arteria Cervicalis Magna presents like transverse myelitis. How to suspect hyperacute onset, associated vertebral involvement, and anterior posterior cord like presentation? And hemicord like presentation can happen when there is um, uh, arteria, you have got uh, and this, uh, post spinal artery, anterior spinal artery, and these arteries are linked by the arteria corona. So, if the arteria corona gets affected, you can get a hemicord syndrome. Then, in the watershed influx in the spinal cord are C4, D4, L1, they are vertical watershed. And transverse water shed is crossing spinothalamic, medial, pyramidal, and ventral horn. These are responsible for the various uh, manifestations due to vascular compromise in cervical compressive myelopathy. Uh, they are false localizing signs due to vascular compromise. This also we have discussed in many sessions on spinal cord. In this plane, if I go to elaborate that, we will not be able to stop this. So now we will see what are the causes for recurrent strokes. One, we know that uh, there is a very high risk of recurrence following a fresh stroke in the immediate post-stroke period in every patient. That we have to remember. And poorly controlled comorbidities, permanent, permanent vessel wall changes, poor collaterals, and TAAs, history of TAA, they have, unless the cause for the TAAs address, it will come. And approximately 17% of the second strokes occur within the first two weeks. And second stroke risk is highest in the first seven days. So thank you. That is uh, stroke localization. And only one criteria I have discussed, that is toast criteria. Others are all clinical bedside localization. That is very uh, perfect only. And uh, toast criteria is for uh, research purpose you can use. So that is uh, stroke localization and stroke diagnosis. Any doubt is there? Uh, few doubts are there, madam. Uh, can uh, transcortical aphasia develop in internal capsule hemorrhage? Yes. You see, you can get transcortical motor aphasia as well as you can have uh, subcortical aphasia. Transcortical motor aphasia what does happen in the anterior artery lesion due to disconnection of the motor area from the uh, mo motor area, but motor area is preserved. So because of the motor area is preserved and is linked with the uh, uh, Broca's area, Wernicke's area and arcuate fasciculus is intact. But an anterior cerebral artery in fact disconnects the motor area from the rest of the brain, parasylvian. So what are transcortical motor aphasia? Transcortical aphasia are parasylvian infos. Perisylvian area is preserved, but the parasylvian area gets disconnected due to an anterior artery infarct. Because of that, they, due to the disconnection of the perisylvian area, they can get a transcortical aphasia. The subcortical lesions, uh, and that supplies up to the anterior part of the internal capsule. So you can get a transcortical aphasia. And subcortical, that is the Mary's quadrilateral space. So you can get the mutism with anorthria, the classical subcortical type of office. Any other question? One question they've asked this uh, global aphasia is associated with chartery involvement among the carotid and MC. Global, uh, info, global aphasia can happen with middle cerebral artery info. Carotid artery, middle cerebral is a branch of the carotid artery. MCA is sufficient to produce global. Yes, so supplies the whole of the perisylvian area. Whole of the perisylvian area is supplied by the superior and inferior division of the MCA. Carotid artery can also produce. When MCA, which is a branch of the carotid, can produce, why not carotid? Carotid can produce, but MCA is sufficient to produce global aphasia. One more question they have asked is, uh, can you please explain about sensory loss distribution among ACA and MC? AC and MC. Yes, you see, middle cerebral artery, we saw that it is the homunculus 
that determines so it will be hemiplegia where the upper limb is more weak hemianesthesia and hemianopia whereas in the anterior cerebral artery it is the parasylvian region so there will be a cortical sensory loss in the lower limb in the cortical sensory areas in the medial hemisphere gets involved so it will not be a hemisensory loss it will be weakness with lower limb dominance and usually cortical sensory loss not the somatic sensation yes it is only the sensory cortex of the lower limb is there in the interhemispheric region not the deep sensory structures whereas in the middle cerebral artery the deep sensory fibers get involved in the aca it is only the sensory cortex so sensory loss will be in the lower limb and it will be of cortical sensation but there is a unique feature as you know in the motor homunculus the leg is from the hip in the interhemispheric fascia whereas for sensation it is below the knee so you can have a uh, weakness of the whole leg and sensory below knee so you may think is it a spinal cord or peripheral nerve that kind of doubt will come but when you examine it will not be somatic sensation it will be cortical sensation any other question One question they asked now, madam. Madam, could you discuss some differentiating clinical features of different brain herniations? Different brain? Herniation. Herniation. Yes. So you can have a trans or uh, fox uh, subfalcial herniation, trans tendorial herniation, and you can have a uh, retrograde herniation. Subfalcial herniation means you have got a hemiplegia. Imagine we saw the whole of hemispheric infarct. So the brain gets uh, herniated to the opposite side across the fox cerebrae. So patient becomes drowsy and opposite side uh, signs will be elicitable. Even though it is right hemiplegia, left plantar will also go up. So patient is drowsy with the left-sided signs. Whereas transtendoral hemi uh, herniation is mainly the brain stem. So respiratory, cardiac arrhythmias, and by bilateral weakness manifests upward herniation happens due to large cerebellar infarct so these people become very drowsy it is a brain stem upper mid brain they get involved so it's a brain stem features whereas subfalcial herniation will be opposite side signs transtendorial can have and this carnogan snatch and all those things can even happen in the subfalcial herniation so that you get a opposite side more than the um, same side opposite weakness more than the same side due to the contra coup effect so even though you are having a right hemiplegia and the hemiplegia is about grade 3 power the left sided features may be more because of the contra coup compression against the bony structures of the normal brain whereas transtendorial and upward herniation it is respiration arrhythmia and brain stem features that are dominating 